the runway, then a left turn and a low down one. Cessna over the threshold, coming up on the white dot, Adderby on the white dot, left turn first available. I got a high wind coming up on about a half mile final, clear to land, Adderby on. Traffic on the left face, you're following the Cessna down, low off your left. Square it up just a little bit, and then we're going to get you in. Start your descent, though. Start your descent on the base. Traffic on final, give me follow on base. Base traffic, start turning toward the numbers now. High wing coming up on quarter mile final, take it all the way down to the green. Cessna taxiing on the green, expedite down to the next hard surface. Get me some speed, there you go, 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 go fast. This is going to be good. I got traffic on a mile final. You're following traffic ahead and your right. High wing coming up on the threshold. Take it all the way down to the green dot. Bob Charlie Sierra, two mile final. A mile final. Turn north. Turn north, and we're going to just make you. Uh, we're going to bring you back around. Jet traffic's coming up on about a mile and a half final runway. Niner clear to land. Okay. All right. Let's, let's let's listen up, guys. If you're on final for runway nine, I want you to offset to the left. I got a jet that's landing on runway nine. The jet's clear to land runway nine. If you can make it. If not. Just continue straight ahead. It looks like you're going around for the jet. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Oh, we had one right in front of us, sir. Dragger. Let's see. Well, we got a tricycle. Tricycle, put it down. Tricycle, put it down. Tricycle, put it down. Tail dragger. Down to the green uh, green dot, then a left turn. Short final here. You click land on nine all the way to the white dot. Go down to the white dot. Find somebody to follow out here. Canard, just come to the runway, and I might have to just send you around. That'll be fine. And for the jet, you just want to stay in this pattern, or you want to go back out for an instrument approach? Stay in a pattern. We're Charlie's here. All right, just stay with me here for a minute. And my tail dragger, and eh, let's see, over the numbers, go down to the green. Come on. And Canard's going to have to go around. Canard, go around. Canard, go around. Canard, right. go around. And my uh, high wing here over the runway, keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. You do not descend. Do not descend. you got a fast guy behind you. Do not descend. My yeah, Here you go. Keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. As soon as the guy behind you gets uh, slowed down, I'm going to put you down. So keep it airborne. The uh, one that just passed the white dot, make a left turn on the hard surface. All right, my uh, high wing tail dragger, you can put it down now. You can put it down now. And Charlie Sierra, let me get you about a mile off. Let's see, Charlie Sierra, I lost. There you are. Make a left hand turn. I'll try to resequence you here on the down ones. We'll see how it looks. Short final, you're clear to land runway nine on the white dot. Clear to land on the white dot. There you go. And the tricycle left on the hard surface and follow the flagman. Welcome. Uh, thanks for being part of the show. And let's see, just find somebody to follow out the, uh, follow on the final, and as you get close to the runway, if it's not going to work, we're going to send you around and then try to re-sequence you. Now, who else got sent around that's not back on the down one? The Canard? Yeah, Canard. All right, Canard, there's a golf stream up there that went around, too. I just lost sight of him, but you're going to make kind of a left-hand turn and stay low. I think Charlie's here once we're out, too. 3,200. Okay, that'll be fine. Just maintain BFR. I don't know what else is up there above you. Probably most everybody's down here. So just make a left-hand turn. We'll try to get, uh, try to get you back here. Uh, Canard's got the uh, jet inside. Okay, the RB, maybe an RB10, whatever, here on final. Keep your speed up and go all the way down to the... Uh, aim for the green dot for me. Uh, actually, keep your speed up. There's a guy behind you. Aim for the green dot, and I'm sure that's plenty of room for you to land on runway 9. You're going to land on runway 9. Number two... You're going to go down to the white dot. Follow the white dot. Actually, you know what? That's 1,500 feet. You're going to land at the white dot. The uh, spacing looks adequate here. Two guys on final. You're kind of tight there. Keep each other in sight, and you're going to uh, aim for the white dot. If it's not going to work, we'll do. Uh, we'll come up with a plan B. We might have to send you around. The second guy behind you yeah, out there in about a two-mile final. Are you slow enough to be able to follow that guy in front of you? You need to go around. Well, I probably shouldn't ask that because I had about five guys to answer me, so I should know better than that after 35 years, you would think, right? All right, so uh, let me see. The guy who's number one, it's number one. What kind of airplane is he? An RV type. All right, RV type. Keep it airborne for me. Keep it airborne. And I got a fast guy behind you. The number two guy over the uh, uh, trees there. Go ahead and put it down on the numbers. Put it down on the numbers. My first guy just coming up on the numbers at the, uh, over the grass at the numbers. I want you to keep T minus one minute and counting. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another 
Why a live stream in the sweltering heat? We're nearly melting in here and we ought to make it the whole way through. Let's hope we do. Um, anyway, so you may have noticed that Dave Corderwood is not here. Dave's got the night off, so we have his body double, a spare Dave <laughs> that's joined us tonight as our uh, as our co-presenter. Dave White, hello and welcome to the presenter's chair. Um, so yeah. yeah, just take it away. Go for it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm the stunt Dave. You're the stunt Dave. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny the first time. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm not going to go there. I, I, I good evening, to uh, good evening, everybody. <laughs> um, so, um, tonight is, is a, quite a complex show from a technical point of view. So, you can expect all sorts of little rumbles in the road as we go along. And the first one is here already as I scroll down and see where I'm going. There you go. So, first things first. And before we move on, I need to announce that we have a new sponsor for the live stream. We are super, super pleased and super proud to have Sky Demon sponsoring us. So that is fantastic. Uh, Sky Demon, the most popular nav app in the UK. And uh, as they say, VFR made easy. If you happen to be one of those rare people who hasn't tried Sky Demon, then I suggest you download it, get yourself over to skydemon.aero and give yourself a 30 day trial and see what you think about it. Um, the other thing that's the other facet of their sponsorship is we get one Sky Demon tip a week. And here is the first ever live stream Sky Demon tip. Hi, I'm Hannah from Sky Demon. And this is today's top tip. There are some useful shortcuts in Go Flying mode. To get to the live pilot log, tap the position report at the top of the map. For the scratch pad, Swipe to the left across the virtual radar. And if you need to quickly route direct, just hold your finger on the Sky Demon icon for a list of nearby airfields. For more information about using Sky Demon, take a look at our user guide, which you can access from our website. Okay, so that was the first mistake. <laughs> Before we move on, thank you very much, Hannah, for those tips, top tips. Uh, Hannah's been, Hannah will be one of the people you speak to if you phone up Sky Demon for tech help. And although she won't admit it, she wrote the user manual. So uh, Hannah knows Sky Demon pretty well. During that little stinger there, what I should have done was um, added Simon and removed everybody else. But A, I forgot to do that. So I'm going to bring Simon in here. Simon, welcome hey, back. Hey, hey, it's good to be back. Live and kicking again. How's the appendix? Uh, it's missing. What, what appendix? Oh my God, it's not there. It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. We're getting there. We're getting there. I've missed you all. We've, we've, we've missed I'd you. like to say we've missed you. Yeah, you bloody <laughs> <are the> liars. <laughs> So um, I'm going to I'm going to gradually remove everybody one by one in a in a smooth way that no one's going to notice and let you present the weather for this weekend. Here you go. Okay, well, uh, good evening, everybody. Like I say, nice to be back. Uh, unfortunately, as I come back, the weather's about to change for the weekend. But, you know, you can't have everything, can you? Um, let me just show you then uh, what's going on for tomorrow. I've put tomorrow's chart up because basically for many of us, that looks like being the better of the day. So it's time to throw a sickie off work, even though you might only just have gone back. Um, this is how Friday shapes up. Um, generally, it's a fair day. Yeah, we've got some showers that just develop sort of central southern Ireland across western parts of Wales. Probably more cloud around tomorrow than there has been uh, during recent days. And I think as well, we're probably going to find some low cloud just drifting down this eastern coast of Scotland and the far northeast of England. But for most of us, uh, as I say, fair amount of cloud around. Base is probably around three to 4,000 feet overall. But look at that little bad fella down towards the southwest and the Bay of Biscay. During the course of Saturday, that edges its way northwards, pushes these fronts northwards as well. That's going to be bringing this thundery breakdown to the fine conditions that we've been seeing. And with quite some contrasting temperatures coming in, i.e. at high levels with cold air coming in at high levels from the north, very hot air still down towards the south. Those contrasting means that we will get some pretty hefty bursts of thundery rain. Um, it looks as if it's going to be the uh, central southern parts of England, southern Wales Saturday morning. You can see here on the uh, ceiling forecast, that's the essentially the cloud base forecast above ground level. We're showing yellows and oranges there, meaning that bases are around 500 
to around 1500 feet now as well as that lots of mist and murk so not particularly great and i know that they're racing for the merlin and uh, schneider trophies around the solent uh this weekend i'm afraid saturday not looking particularly great for it um danny's eastern coast again eastern scotland northeastern parts of england maybe some low cloud on saturday western scotland northern and western ireland probably looking better overall and actually northwest england perhaps the north of wales base is here around three to four thousand feet so not too bad there but i have to say not a patch on what we've had recently and then for sunday the area of low pressure drifts off towards the east we get quite a bit of rainfall across central east now as you see it there across east anglia and the southeast some uncertainty over exactly where that's going to be but i think the main story are these troughs that you see in here as well these are going to be bringing heavy thundery showers developing during the course of sunday afternoon and you see that here look on the uh, on the ceiling forecast those yellows and oranges meaning we've got bases between about a thousand and fifteen hundred feet again northern and western areas so sort of scotland and ireland look a bit better with more of a northerly flow there bases around two to three thousand feet so better for western scotland better for ireland probably better for the north and the west of wales uh, during the course of sunday but i'm afraid for most of the rest of us it's not looking particularly great so we've got lots to talk about at weather school on sunday and if you fancy coming along to weather school online i've just announced the new dates for my next course that's got places available and that's going to be on saturday the 18th and 25th of september from 09 30 to 12 30 hours presented live online by me well, you can't have everything, can you? And um, uh, if you want to be able to build your confidence in flying weather and also trust forecasts that you're seeing from various different sources, then you can get yourself along to Aviation Weather School. More information at weatherschool.co.uk. So whatever you're doing, have a safe weekend. Enjoy it despite the weather, perhaps one for many of us to build up those brownie points. But uh, keep the sun shining and I'll see you soon. Bye for now. Oh, so close. So close. Nearly. <laughs> uh, Johnny, come on, Johnny, sharpen up. <laughs> I just... <laughs> we, we, make it, oh, we make it look um, slick. <laughs> one day, we'll, one week we'll get it. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we might need a professional person of some kind. Professional but anyway, person. thank you. Um, so what have we got tonight? So tonight we've got a huge, an unusually large amount of news, mainly caused by uh, Oshkosh starting next week, which we'll talk about as well. We have Johnny interviewing Eddie Carter. We've got Ed talking to Steve Slater about the LAA rally. And we've got a special little video feature produced by uh, Marcus Fall Litherland, who help us behind the scenes with some of the tech stuff. Not the tech stuff tonight, because obviously they'd be embarrassed about that if they were involved in that. Um, but some of the tech stuff, and they put together a little film for us about Silverstone and uh, Western and the British Grand Prix. Plus, obviously, we've got our spare Dave, who's come along to, to provide sage advice and feedback <laughs> on various... Oh, have you made a mistake? ...various bits <laughs> and pieces. Um, so, on to the news, and um, very sadly, before we get on to the rest of the news, I have to pass on some very bad news, which is that... Um, Rod Wilderbar, who has run the aviation school at Goodwood, who started at Goodwood, I believe, when he was 16 as an apprentice, um, passed away last week. It, it was just unbelievably shocking. And anybody who met Rob um, and, and who spoke to him at any time would, would just remember a super positive, super encouraging, super smiley, always friendly, ju just one of those people who makes a huge, huge difference in general aviation. He'll be massively, massively missed. And it, it's, it's, frankly, it's just not really set in to be honest um so uh rest in peace rob mm -hmm. um yeah well there you go um so moving on slightly from that uh cirrus had a big announcement ahead of um ahead of oshkosh and they announced a larger or not a larger engine actually but more power for the uh sf uh, 250 so we made a little video of it using some of their video and some of our voices Earlier this week, Cirrus told us about some updates to the SF-50 Vision Jet, now known as the G2 Plus. It brings extra power and better runway performance. The extra power comes from uh, tweaks to the Fadex software, which Cirrus worked on with William. So depending on how hot and high you are, you get between 4% and 20% better performance. Uh, the 20% coming at the hotter and higher end of the scale. So that's uh, good news. They also introduced um, Wi-Fi in the cockpit, although uh, Wi-Fi and internet connectivity, I should say, in the cockpit. 
Um, but that really only applies in the US. God, I love that shot. Amazing. Um, so earlier this week, I also spoke to Matt Burgle, who's the product line director for the SF50. If you'd like a bit more detail and see that interview, hop on over to our YouTube channel. So yeah, there you go. An extra. That's quite a lot. I mean, that's quite a lot of extra power if you're hot and high. And, um, it is. Yeah. I, did, I, I must point out that obviously, just before you gave that news, you you called the the Vision Jet the SF250, and I'd just like to point out that. Cirrus hasn't made a new model of the, the Vision Jet. <laughs> it is still the SF50. It just hasn't well, happened. <laughs> I, they could have. Did I say that? I, I, I might have been sworn to secrecy on that. It might be the well, new. You may, may have given the yeah. game away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know people. Are, I know people are challenged by the looks of the Vision Jet, but I think it's. I think. I think it's just amazing little package. I think it's a great little airplane, actually. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I think if you're moving from a piston into a jet, it's it's great. If you're, I think if you're one of these people going, no, I fly a Global Express, don't you know? Then it, it's probably a little bit small and slow. But actually, the SF50 is a pretty it's it's a good looker compared to some of the other small, very light jets out there. That's you it. know, yeah. Dave, what do you think about this idea? As a, as a as a someone not quite on the inside, but almost, as it were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What about if we, if next time Cirrus are over here doing a demo tour on the SF50, if we persuade them to take us and a few readers flying, make a little video of it? Do you think that would be fun? I think it'd be an awfully good idea. I think I think so too. Let's let's. Do you go around the block? <laughs> if you're watching this, bring us over an SF50 Vision Jet, and we'll all play with it. I thought it was also quite funky with the way they got the extra power, which just seems to be a software thing. So. Mm. Yeah, I would imagine Mr. Williams just went, how much would you like? <laughs> you, like? you see this little slider? I just yeah. changed the value in this particular line of code to yeah. 120 or something. Yeah. It's the equivalent of us remapping our cars, I guess. Yeah, yeah. you just we're, move we're, it up. We're, we're, melts yeah. Back. <laughs> yeah, we're all a bit old for that, Johnny. I know you might remap your car. <laughs> yeah, the trick is don't tell your insurance company. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I used to set the points in my car. That's it. Flyer does not endorse this behaviour. <laughs> yeah, can, I wonder if you can set the set set the volume level to eleven or something. That's what you need to do, isn't it? Maybe if it was the Spinal Tap edition. Uh, you've lost mm. me now. Uh, you've lost me now. Um, yeah, you, you're that young. Just on, on one one further one one further Cirrus Jet um, Vision Jet SF fifty bit of news uh, that came through, not really related to the um, to the extra power. But you know they have that kind of press. Oh no! Oh dear! <laughs> Don't say we've lost Ian. He's he's it's reached it's for the ball. Are there any thunderstorms in Wiltshire? I know. <laughs> Not at this end. I'm only down the road from him, and it's, I can't hear him. Dave, have you right. sabotaged him? Well, well, well he well, either yeah. confirm or deny. That's it. <laughs> While we figure out what's what's malfunctioned with Ian. Uh, uh, I can give you some news about uh, the Rotex 582, and it's sad news in that the Rotex 582 has be, is uh, going to be retired from production. Um, this is the legendary 64 horsepower two-stroke engine that uh, BRP Rotex have produced. It's been on the product line alongside the 900 series four-strokes. Um, but Rotex have said, actually, they found now that it's nearly a full transition um, for light and ultralight aircraft towards four-strokes. Um, so they're they're going to stop production at the end of the year. They're going to carry on supporting it, um, and they've said that they'll do that for uh, at least ten years with parts. Um, but um, yeah, they, they say it's 100% now. De de demand from customers is for four-stroke engines. Um, I've never flown out, have I? I? I can't. I'm not sure if I've flown behind a 582 or not. Um, but it is. It's it's testament to the brilliance of that engine that it stayed on the Rotac. Rotax product catalog for so long because they've got such mm. a they've got an amazingly reliable fleet in the 900 series and to keep mm. a two stroke in there it says a lot about what that engine you know represented so um, yeah. very very good yeah, I think oh, there are a lot of people um, with a lot of uh, history behind them sort of crying in their beer quite rightly about the uh, the end of an era there that's yeah really amazing engine. Mm. Yeah, definitely. It'll be. It'll. I'm, I'm sure it's. You know that they've taken that decision on their on their own data. But I'm. It'll be interesting to see if this Yamaha engine that uh, that has been was spoken about last week comes along and that fills a similar horsepower gap. But obviously, hopefully, four strokes. So. Mm. 
We'll see. Welcome back, Mr. Seeger. Yes, I'm you really reached, tight, You reached up to push your button, and apparently that caused caused your safe return. <laughs> so I, didn't, again. I didn't finish, but let me try that again. Um, the the safe return, which has been certified in the Cirrus in the USA for quite a while now, has just been approved by EASA over here. So if you're flying your European registered SF50 Vision Jet, you can press that safe return button and know that it's a completely certified feature. So there you go. This is, this is why you needed to do it. You would press it, wouldn't you? Certified or not. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to press this. The button, the button in your studio must work now because certifi certification has been approved. Well, I looked around <laughs> and you, you, were drinking, you were drinking something and then you were like... Yeah. No, we, <laughs> we were frozen. It, it was you. you you'd got on board. Uh, it was me, yeah. So did, anyway, did, I've, I've, I've done the Rotex news. I think yeah, Johnny we, we need to step, the Garmin step, news. Step back one and uh, talk about Garmin. Yeah, so they've um, Garmin Pilot. They've made things like NOTAMs, you know, easier to understand over the past few months and years of software updates. Uh, and they've got a new release out now, which makes it even easier. Um, so things like runway and airport closures are depicted on there, um, runway crosses, that sort of thing. And then for those of us in Europe, uh, version 10.5, which is the new one, adds ICAO airspace classification colors on the map. And they're all in alignment with ICAO standards and in-country charts like DFS and IGN. Um, and they're all enabled for Garmin's who, uh, so users who've got a Garmin Pilot Europe standard license. Uh, and you could select things like TAFs or MOS to display graphically on the map and all of that. So that's really good. Um, and also in Garmin news, talking of buttons, they've released a new Smart Glide feature. So if you remember the Garmin Autoland system, they've now done something similar for engine failures. So, um, you know, we're all taught how to deal with an engine failure, but this is a sort of takes a bit of the workload away uh, if, if something does happen to you. So you need compatible avionics like the GTN uh, XI series of navigators. Um, you basically hit the button. And it does all sorts of things. It will compute your speed, your glide range. It will find the nearest airfield. And if you've got a compatible autopilot, it will engage the autopilot and pitch you for the best glide and point you towards the nearest airfield to, and set you up to within about, I think it's two miles of the runway, at which point it will t tell you to take control again. But it's an, you know another sort of string in Garmin's bow of improving safety. Hey, it's it's one of those things that's that helps the, during the the high pressure bit, doesn't it? Mm. It's it's like yeah. having someone there sat next to you going, "I've got this bit." While you have a look, so mm. yeah, Johnny, that um, terrain corrected glide range thing reminds me of something. I, I can't think what. It's a bit like when you were talking earlier about the changes to the um, map display. I, I'd give it a six out of Sky Demon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the um, I think the interesting thing with the glide slave is it's, it's clearly part of um, the whole Autoland ESP Garmin um, little family of stuff. So just keep adding features. And I think when they move from the normal GTNs to the upgraded GTN XIs, the extra processing power um, mm -hmm. gave them the ability to do some other things that they couldn't do with the, with the GTN. Yeah, a joke, and joking apart, that is clearly. All of that is clearly a step onto the way aviation is going generally, um, not just within general aviation as we know it, but all this advanced air mobility, um, all the human carrying drone stuff, it needs that technology. And um, and this is the time to bring it in and, and baseline it with something uh, that packages it in something which is well known. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Given my absence, I'm just looking through the news stories and I'm wondering whether I'm up next with the Avidyne story. It's you. It's you it's next. It's me with the Avidyne. Mm -hmm. So uh, yesterday I sat through a virtual online press conference from Avidyne who, who came out earlier. They've just launched something called Vantage. Vantage is a suite of avionics, two 12-inch screens. Um, basically, these are kind of the successors to what used to be the Avidyne Integra system, which is what you would have had in the early Cirrus. Siri, 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 Siri. Anyway, um, but there was something in the middle called R9, but I think that's one of those things that nobody talks about anymore. So along comes Vantage, 
Um, and the first Vantage thing to be certified, I don't believe it's certified yet, I have asked a question but I haven't heard, is the retrofit for a Cirrus. So you can retrofit the two, two Avidines and then some Avidines, IFD 540s, 550s, 430s and stuff like that. You have to have a new uh, instrument panel as well, which Avidine will also supply. Um, and it's fully compatible with their autopilots and everything else like that. So they're kind of going head to head with Garmin on the Cirrus retrofit market there. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, that's a big yeah. market too. It's a, it, it is a big market, and clearly they're not going to stop with the Cirrus. They're going to want to compete with the retrofit. Um, I assume with the retrofit market for people who want twelve-inch screens, which are yeah. And you've already got already got Garmin out there and Dynon with their HDX. So, well, it's interesting. Gar Dynon are kind of moving up slowly into the certified world, into the mm. yeah from the non-certified world. Garmin are kind of moving with the G3X have gone bought the G3X up from the non-certified world, but they're obviously doing stuff in the jet certified world as well. Um, so, there's a lot there's a lot of innovation going on here. I mean, when you think about it, the old days with Bendix King would bring out the Silverline KX155, the radio that's your radio for yet another 20 years or something. Um, it just all moves so quickly now. So I guess we all win. Lots of competition is good for people like us. Yes. And it's not just competition either. I think it's good for the certified and non-certified worlds to start coming together. The obvious place for that to start is within avionics because retrofitting is, is something useful. But with luck, that will eventually, and it might be a while, transfer into FRX and engines also. That would be very good, wouldn't it? Who's, who's got a noisy aeroplane around them? I, I, I have the um, the air ambulance flying across my house at the moment, and I have the window <laughs> open front and back. So, <laughs> Brought to you by Wiltshire Air Ambulance. <laughs> Wiltshire. Based, it, based in Semington, for anyone who really wants to know. Mm. I, think it, I think it might be there. It usually is. Um, yes. So what Me. else have we got? It's you next, isn't it, Ed? Yes. Or have you uh, so, done that so, one already? No, no, I, no, it's me next. Definitely me next. Go for it. Okay. Uh, so there's a CEO vacancy coming up. It's at the British Microlight Association. Uh, we've heard that uh, this week that uh, current CEO, Jeff Whale, uh, he's been there since 2006, and Jeff is retiring so if you think you've got what it takes to take on, uh, follow on from Jeff, then uh, contact BMA Chairman Rob Hughes. Uh, there's details on our website, also on theirs. Uh, deadline is August the 11th. So um, big shoes to fill there, but um, an exciting, exciting vacancy. So um, and BMA have done a lot and made lots and lots of progress under Jeff. Mm. Exciting times with the 600 kilogram microlite stuff coming in as well. All sorts yeah. of. Uh, all sorts of challenges, and the right person for that job could really, uh, really make a significant difference. Dave, how about you? Are you going to apply for it? Me? No, no. CEO looks like a hard job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I agree. <laughs> um, okay. Talking of which, talking of hard jobs, is that is it me next? It is you. Have you, okay. you you've heard about your rat? Have you? I've heard about a rat, as it were. So a couple of rats. If you're flying to the uh, heading to the Isle of Wight or the Solent this weekend, although given Simon's weather forecast, you may well not be. There's a little rat there, which is surfaced to 2,000 feet. These are the new ones that keep springing up every time there's an air race. There never used to be rats for air races, but there are rats for air races now. And here's a slightly weird-shaped rat for the air race. So beware of that. And... So that kind of leads me to another story, which it turns into a little bit of a rant, really. And frankly, in, in my opinion, a bit of a kind of shocking thing. Um, last Friday, there was a NOTAM published, which was for uh, another bit of restricted airspace. This particular bit of restricted airspace went all the way from Sandringham to Windsor. It didn't say who it was for, but it probably doesn't take a genius to guess. And this uh, was published around lunchtime on Friday. This is an extract from that NOTAM. Um, we all know that NOTAMs are a bit pants anyway, but this is just the bloody ridiculous. I mean, you imagine sitting there plotting that. Just who, who does that? Who does that? I, I wouldn't mind giving that to everyone at Nats and the CA and anyone else who actually had a had an involved had a hand in it to to to, to plot it themselves. Um, fortunately, I, I, the, there was supposed to be a briefing document which came out on Monday, which was at the actual day of the restriction. Um, and that briefing document actually had a graphical depiction of it, but that didn't come out until Monday, so that was a bit of a pain. The people at Skydemon, and I'm not just saying this because they, they're the new sponsors, this is, this is 
genuinely what happened. They kind of picked up that note and realized it was a bit of a pain and it couldn't actually be coded um, or it couldn't be displayed by machine. So they kind of went in and manually intervened and created this so that people flying on Monday after that was that was done could actually see where the airspace was. Um, that's a huge piece of airspace. That's a huge uh, rat. And there are some fairly uh, complex altitudes and some requirements. You can you can go through it if you speak to certain people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can basically dig your way through there and find out all those details if you want. Um, and it just seemed to me that it was a bit of a ridiculous thing to put this out. You know, here's something that's supposedly safety critical, I presume, and you put it out. And, and the CA's policy is to MOR anyone who goes in a rat without permission without complying with that so mm -hmm. surely they ought to make it a little bit easy to actually understand it a little bit easy to, to give it enough time make it graphical from the start and do something better so i did actually ask the ca about this i said come on this is just a bit ridiculous isn't it you could surely you can do better um and i got this reply um which i find kind of uh, surprising really so have, have a read tell me what you think Ooh, let's have a legal and moral duty to ensure this is from a ca spokesperson by the way um, more to ensure their flight can be made safely and, and he or she doesn't sound like this that's me uh, made safely and always should be aware of any local airspace restrictions that affect their primary skywise does not replace the use of no times and the need for all pilots to study those you see that bit at the beginning a legal and moral duty i mean this come on there's legal and moral duties from from the caa as well and um frankly mm -hmm. i think that was missed um cub on the flying uh, on the flyer forum um who is um, an enormously respected airspace person i believe it was him who said that's setting ga up to fail um if it wasn't cub whoever it was is absolutely right and i think um given the prevailing issues with um airspace and mors um which doesn't minimize the seriousness of it at all but given those prevailing issues i think that is truly shocking and i agree with you in I think it's I think it's I think it's appalling. I think someone at the CA needs to have a word with themselves, whether it's the C I think there's a bit of a debate over whether it's the CA or Nuts or whoever it happens to be. I don't really care who it is. Just get yourself together. And you know, it's not if you were gonna mark out a road and there was a dangerous bend with an adverse camber and you put some poxy little rusty sign in amongst some trees and didn't bother lighting it at night and then people f drove themselves off the road, would you go, Well, they should have read that, you know. You you know, we're all in this together. Let's make it a little bit easier. Don't set us up to fail. Don't set us up to prosecute mm. us. Just get it bloody right in the first place. We're all just trying to do the right thing here. It's ridiculous. And talking of which, I'm just going to go slightly off piste a little bit. Uh, forgive me for this. This is the, this is my own hints and tip here. So uh, I'm just going to make myself full screen for a reason because I want to show you uh, an example on here. So if you've got a no time on here, and this particular, let me just go through here, see if I can find one. Found earlier. There you go. So th here, here's another rat, and in this particular case, this rat's actually actually well uh, defined on here. But if you're scrolling through here and you can't figure out where they are, and it would have been the same with the other no time, if you just click on those lats and longs, it actually shows you on the map and gives you a rough idea of, of where they are and where you can uh, plan your route. So there you go. Let me make myself on full screen anymore. Um, so or, even even if the CA get it completely wrong and put out something that's incomprehensible, and it'd be quite interesting, wouldn't it, to take the the pilots of NAS and the pilots of the CA, chuck them a half mil chart, some some pens are, are scaled and that, and go go on then plot that and see how they get on. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure they get there eventually, but it, it yeah, you know, it's 2021. Don't do this kind of crap. Seriously, the pilots, but the author of that response to you, I think that was that's that's just a ducking issue. Mm. Yeah, I think it's um, ha have have a good read of it, people. Wh whoops, finger trouble. I think it was um, I, I and I and I checked to make sure this wasn't background. So, are you okay with me running this? And, yep, absolutely. So that that is just that response encapsulate encapsulates the whole attitude problem uh, with this whole thing. I think, I'm afraid. So there you go. Mm. We can all do better, but so can you, CEA and Nats and whoever else is involved in that. It's ridiculous. Um, right. So, what's next? I think we have uh, we we dispatched Mark Liverland to tour Western to find out how they got on with the Silverstone Grand Prix. So, here's Mark Liverland's little video. It's just over three minutes. So, if you want to see the full video, head on over to our YouTube channel, um, or, and the link is in the description in, 
in this one, as it were. For the 1999 British Grand Prix, Silverstone set the world record for the highest number of movements in a day with 4,200. And many of those came from here at Torreston. And again, just a day before the lifting of restrictions, tomorrow Silverstone will host a capacity crowd of 140,000 people for the British Grand Prix. So I'm here with Chris Brown, Aerodrome Manager. Thank you very much for talking to me today, Chris. It's my pleasure. How many movements are you expecting this weekend? Probably around 60 movements today. We did 80 movements yesterday, and tomorrow it will probably be in the region of uh, two to 300. And how does that compare with previous years? The numbers this year are very, very similar to 2019, in fact, which is actually a good, a good sign. Is it in spikes? Oh, very much so, yeah. yeah. When the people are flying in, it will be down to uh, gaps of three minutes. During the race time, it's, it's quiet here. It's very, very quiet. And the helicopters that come here, what are they doing? All of the operators now just drop their passengers into the circuit, then they have to get out. We're obviously three miles down the road. We basically become a heliport park, car parking area. And it's a pretty impressive sight when you see our two grass runways absolutely covered in helicopters from one end to the other. So down on those two runways, how many, how many aircraft would that be? I would say 70 to 80 helicopters parked up. That creates a lot of extra workload. What are your major pain points? Financially, obviously, it's a, it's a big outlay. I mean, we have to we pull in extra staff. The airfield is completely modified to the way it operates on a day-to-day -day basis. We split it into two parts. So we have a northern side and a southern side. The southern side is used specifically for helicopters coming into park. On the northern sector, we will have any fixed wing traffic that's coming in, helicopters that are coming in to drop off passengers, and also our rotors running um, refuel department is situated out in the middle of the grass on the far side of the runway. November Sierra, Roger, good to lift. Fire east gate and service wind 070 degrees 10 knots. Obviously we're air ground, we can't tell people what to do. So our procedures are well known and they have been developed over a number of years from the original days when it was a full air traffic control service for the Grand Prix until what we use today. How well behaved are the pilots? These guys are the elite of the industry. They are really professional um, and it's actually it's a pleasure to work with them. How is your relationship with your neighbours? The relationship with the, week, uh, for the, with the neighbours over the weekend is generally very good. Um, the Silverstone event brings an awful lot of money into the local economy, so it's actually, you know, everyone sort of says, OK, let them get on with it, we'll do it. And how important to Tour Western is the Grand Prix weekend? Yes, it is important, and it does bring a good uh, chunk of money into the airfield, which, you know, we all work in the industry. This industry is vastly hit by weather, unfortunately, so it just makes up for those days when there is nothing going on. I have to say that I think the general aviation industry will come out of the other side of this pandemic very, very well. I think a lot of people have gone turned to GA to travel because they don't want to travel with numbers. So the industry, I think, will survive and prosper in the future. Thank you again, Chris. Best of luck for the rest of the weekend. Thank you. Fingers crossed. Really interesting. interesting. Yeah, pretty yeah. impressive setup there. Yeah. Where did Dave go? Who knows? We lost him. <laughs> did he get bored? <laughs> we'll see whether he reconnects. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna allow myself a moment of cruelty. Just Mark and Siobhan, thank you very much for that. I, I know you did that for us as a favour. It was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. I just need to comment on this little, little, little still. Yeah. That's a, that's a that's an unfortunately misplaced belt. <laughs> that is an unfortunately misplaced belt. There you go, Mark. You'll be forever famous for your unfortunately misplaced belt. Yeah, and we've got we've got bring, a Dave back as well. Oh, let me bring Stunt Dave back. Stunt Dave has arrived. <laughs> Sorry about that. IT issues. I don't know what. That's uh, right. Luckily, you had a backup. Yeah. I think it's the heat that does it, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So did 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 you did you see the uh, did you see the misplaced belt while we were just embarrassing Mark Litherland? Uh, no, I did not. 
Oh, there you go. Here's a still from his video. Oh, that's harsh. <laughs> I realise it's harsh. I, I, I'm <laughs> happy you'll talk to me again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so many things I want to say, but I won't. <laughs> no. good, good point. So, um, Johnny, talk to us about the next story for which there is no picture for me to put on screen for Don't you. Don't worry. Yeah. So this is all about that heat. Um, so obviously it's hot out and that can cause issues with these things. You all know what that app is. Um, but anyway, it's not about the apps. It's about the devices themselves. So the CA have kind of issued a warning basically to say that the heat wave can cause these things to overheat. I'm sure we've all experienced it. I know I have. Um, and their basis is that if you're relying on this to fly around and it conks out, then that could be your navigation, your only navigation kind of um, uh, method out the window, which could lead to infringements, basically. So they've said that you should carry a backup, whether that's another tablet or a phone or whatever, um, and just be prepared for that and be prepared to, you know, if, if things do go wrong, orbit in your position, talk to air traffic control. But they've also said, make sure you carry a chart that's marked up with your route and a printed plug. I don't know who's done one of those recently. That's it. Also carry a member of Nats to plot all the points <laughs> of no times for you on the yeah. map. Yeah. <laughs> I think, so I think next time I... call, call D and D. So <laughs> next time I was going to say, next time I go flying, I think I'm going to call D and D with a like, simulated, a simulated overheated tablet. <laughs> <laughs> They'll appreciate the practice, I think. That's it. They've yeah. frozen again. No, he's not. He's moved. That's okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm freezing in and out, so it's it's not denial of service. It's rural broadband. Uh -huh. uh, no, no problem. It's good to have you here, even if you're coming in and out. So yeah. it's, it's, and we've also it's, got it's, some new um, safety sense leaflets that have been launched by the CAA. The first one's covering flying with passengers. So if you head to the Flyer website, you can read the news story there and get a link to it and read through it. Um, they're going to start updating all of them from things like operating from grass strips to winter flying uh, and all of that sort of thing. So they'll be releasing those, I guess, over the next few months. Over the and over the next year, that was that was a good freeze frame of Dave there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay. what's the next story then? Uh, Ed. Uh, so, oh, Oshkosh, this is, uh, this is obviously uh, next week. Uh, EA Air Venture Oshkosh kicks off. Uh, we'll we sadly, I normally we're there, but uh, this year we'll be covering it remotely as we couldn't get the bits of paperwork required from the U.S. Embassy to travel. Um, which is a bit of a shame, but uh, luckily we've got some people on the ground, uh, and we'll be Peter's uh, talking. Oh, Dave's gone, <laughs> uh, and we've got uh, we've got uh, plenty of people that we'll be talking to uh, live at the show next week. So uh, look to Flyer for your coverage. But uh, mm. big show that I think they're talking of a record-breaking audience that will beat 2019, which was half a million odd people. So um, that could be amazing. It's it's such a I've been looking at a couple of, there was some guy who landed there a little while ago, a couple of days ago, and did a walk around of, between the sort of stands being built up. And then there's obviously the EAA's webcams that are kind of there. Um, it's just so, so frustrating. I can't remember. This is the first time I have, well, I can't remember how many years I've been going now. Not, not as long as you, I'm sure, Ed, but it's just so frustrating not to be there. And then bloody mm. Facebook comes up with, oh, here's a memory. Here's that year you flew to Oshkosh from Maine, or here's it. Oh man, and it's just so bloody frustrating. And we applied. We we applied. You need something called a national interest exemption certificate. We applied through, for one through the American Embassy. And they went, sure, come along for your interview on February 2022, February the fifth. We went, um, that's not going to work, is it? And tried to persuade them otherwise, and they just said, we'll see you in February. So, uh, yes. Not Never mind. A friend of mine phoned me earlier from the Oshkosh flight line and said, I thought this would make you feel better. It's like, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Bye. <laughs> oh, oh. All right. Who wants to talk about Guild of Aviation Artists then? Me. Yeah, in the interest of uh, time, I'll, I'll talk really quickly. So the yeah, Guild of Aviation Artists are holding their online gallery now. So we've talked about it before. You can go to Gava, G -A -V -A .org uk, and you can go through and look and find things to spend money on. So go and do that. 
There you go. And a little bit of news from me. Uh, the Leeds East, Leeds East. There's a there's an event uh, coming up in August called Private Flyer at Leeds East. It's not actually got anything to do with us at all. It's organised by Alex Aining, who used to organise Aero Expo, and uh, we are the official media partner of that. We don't have a stand. Um, but we it's only a one day show, and it's up in Leeds. It's like that's more than half an hour away. And um, so, but we will be flying up and wandering around. So if you're going to be going along, come along, see us, um, grab your free lanyard, your free oil filter and say hello we look forward to meeting you there so that's what's happening on that um what else have we got we got some laa rally news coming up a little bit later which is ed and yes. news obviously that the um uh the aviation minister robert courts will be joining us in a pre-recorded interview for the live stream that's taking place on the 21st of september so a little while to go uh, but we will be giving you the opportunity to ask some questions and we'll be putting that out to the Flyer Forum. So. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Good. Johnny, must be your turn now. Yeah, so um, for the interview this week, I spoke to Ellie Carter, who some of you might know from Twitter. Um, she and lots of other people have been receiving uh, Air League bursaries and scholarships this week, and she was one of the lucky recipients. So I spoke to her and we'll play a video and you can find out more about it. Did, did we press Morning, it? Ellie, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Thanks for joining us, Ellie. Now, um, just give us a bit of background. How old you are? How long you've been flying? Where did you learn to fly? Um, so I'm currently 18. Um, I've been flying for half my life, so since I was nine. Um, I fly from various airfields at the moment. So I fly from a very small farm strip called Westercott, Dunkerswell a bit, Bodmin and Eggersford and quite a few. But I learned to fly at Dunkswell. I did my PPL there and now I'm doing my IMC in aerobatics at Botman. Brilliant. Um, so you've had some kind of good news this week haven't you? Can you tell us a bit about that? I have. So I was awarded an Air League bursary for five hours towards my IMC which is really great because IMC is really important from a safety point of view but also it's quite hard being a young uh, pilot that funds their own flying so it's really really helpful and Often it buys you time to earn enough money to then carry on um, and do stuff that otherwise you wouldn't be able to do. So I'm incredibly grateful and I hope it shows that of to our young kids that you can fund your own flying and you can fly and there is help out there. Yeah, absolutely. Is this the first time you've had a, an Air League bursary or have you been supported by other organisations as well? I had a scholarship from the LAA a couple of years ago towards my PPL, but that's the only one I've got. When do you think you'll be able to get, get cracking with the, the, the bursary money and start flying? Uh, so I've already booked in uh, five hours of flying within two weeks. So I think on Monday I'm doing aerobatics in the morning. I'm seeing middle of the day and then aerobatics in the afternoon, <laughs> weather permitting. So that'll be really fun. That'll be a busy day, yeah. Just explain how you got into flying originally. Um, yes, yeah, so I got in fly into flying in a pretty strange way. Um, probably the best way to find out is to Google me. <laughs> but um, I was always fascinated with maths and physics as a kid. Um, it was kind of always in my blood and I used to build various flying contraptions and throw them out the windows with the dolls that my gran gave me as crash test dummies. Um, so I think most of them ended up being eaten by the dog in the next door neighbor's garden. Mm -hmm. But as my kind of maths and physics knowledge kind of progressed, I became obsessed with the U2 spy plane and how it clung to the edge of space mm. so I wrote a letter to them and asked if I could see the aircraft and it kind of went to the security risk and um, the pentagon is a security risk and almost got my parents arrested um unfortunately they weren't and in the end they realized I was just a nine-year-old girl at the time and they said yeah come and see the aircraft on a swap over day and they got me my first flight and it kind of all snowballed from there. So I really owe all of my achievements to them, which is really nice of them. Yeah, that's great. And then was there a bit of a gap between that and then you starting flying training? Yeah, so I was very lucky that being a complete hanger rat and pretty much hanging around airfields, I kind of got quite a few flights and that's where I met Richard, who owns a cub that I fly. And he took me for various flights when I was that kind of age. And then when I was 12, I started gliding, mostly to fill in the gap. Um, and so on my 14th birthday. 
and then when I was 15, I started power training, and then so my 16th birthday. Brilliant. Kind of now, the cub itself is quite an interesting one, isn't it? Can you tell us a bit about the history of it? A little bit. Um, I wouldn't say I'm an absolute expert, but <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, it was built in 1943, and it actually serves a liaison plane in D-Day. So I think it actually um, spent some time in Belgium um, and kind of travelled around the around Europe in World War Two, which is really cool. It then went to a flight school and became a flight training aircraft before being privately owned, and it was converted back into US military colours. Brilliant. So really uh, and so, what what sort of flying are you doing with it? Because I see on Twitter you're always taking younger, even younger people flying with you. Are they people you're kind of trying to get into aviation, or are they people who? have an interest in it who want to experience flying um a bit of both i think if you love aviation it's, you're actually hooked from it so you can tell instantly who's going to be a pilot so really anybody that shows a bit of an interest i'm offered to take them for flight <laughs> if the parents will allow mm. and it's just such an amazing thing when you're taking someone for flight and their face lights up for the first time and it's just it's brilliant mm. so that's one thing we do in it and um, we do a lot of short field landings in it and take it to some wacky places and I'm really really lucky I love a sense of adventure so being able to fly to Lundy Island and fly over a massive pot of dolphins on the way there and then land on this pretty short rough strip is really really nice um and to be honest that flying probably helped me an awful lot when I had an engine failure because mm. it was those skills that I learned that probably allowed me to land in that short field so yeah yeah so I yeah, uh, I was get that was one of my next questions actually because you posted that on on Twitter last year and you had an engine failure. I'm guessing on the climb out at 500 feet. What what happened? Um, yeah, so we were doing circuits on a Bobman um, in the aircraft I'm now doing my aerobatics in. It just had a new engine, um, so we got to about the third circuit and we took off. And I kind of realised the rate of climb and the speed wasn't really building up as I'd like. So I decided I'm going to turn around and go back into the field. So I did a tight circuit and about halfway down when the engine completely failed. Um, it was kind of lucky that I would, did decide to do a close circuit because I had the height then to get into the airfield, yeah. which was probably the best field around. Um, anybody that knows Bobby knows there's a massive 830 and a pretty deep valley-like field next to it. So I landed across there in the long grass and luckily the plane was okay and there was no damage. <laughs> it was also on a fly-in so it was pretty busy and kind of hectic. but. Wow. It was a good experience. Was this a, is it Super Decathlon? Yes, yeah. Mm. It turned out to be the engine preservation oil was left in and that kind of got out and didn't do much good. Ah, interesting. <laughs> interesting. Okay. So that was a good a good learning experience for you then. Have you had any other not necessarily incidents, but any any other real, you know, character building things when you've been flying? I wouldn't say anything like that. Um, when I before I got my license, um, I flew into be able to Ernesto with a pilot called Reg, who owns an Aronka, and we had a big block on the way back, so that was good fun. Um, and it, again, it taught me a lot from a young age about being really aware on hot days about old aircraft and what fuel you use. And I think he ran it on part petrol, and that was why. Yeah. Um, and we do it in the car, but you obviously it teaches you to be aware of when you're doing it. Um, but I also flew the Cub to Belgium and although there was nothing hair raising that went with it, it was such a long flight and in some airspace that we're not used to. Um, in Belgium and Europe, there's transponder zones. So we couldn't like fly above a thousand feet and all that and crossing the channel for the first time. It taught me an awful lot. And yeah, I'm really grateful for the flying the Cub to give me. It's awesome. Yeah. Would you say it's your favourite aircraft or do you have another one that you've been flying? That's an incredibly difficult question. Um, <laughs> I love all different forms of flying and I guess from there I've got different aircraft that I like for different things. Mm. Um, out of the ones I've been flying, the Cub has definitely given me so much and taught me so much. It's really progressed my flying so it's got to be on the favourites list. Um, and the Super Dia Calflon because again it's taught me so much and it's been doing aerobatics and it's just so much fun but um out of the aircraft i'd love to fly there's kind of different classic categories which is kind of confusing but um ultimately historically i'd love to fly a bow fighter or a lysander or a newport or something like that yeah. um 
aerobatics wise I'd love to get into RVs and extras and all that kind of stuff um GA I still choose a Cub to be honest it's mm. such a lovely aircraft um yeah that's great and um, what sort of message would you give to other young people who want to pursue a career in aviation I mean you've you've been supported by grants and bursaries and that kind of thing I mean you definitely don't get every single bursary you apply for I've only got a couple but if you're dedicated enough and you're prepared to put a fair amount of hard work in you'll get some and you'll be able to fund it and you'll have so, so many amazing experiences that definitely outweigh the hard work you put into it there's just so many amazing things that i've seen and done in aviation that it's so worth it so definitely give it a go just try your best yeah fantastic well thank you very much for joining us it's been really interesting talking to you and congrats again on the bursary that's great thank you Wow, Ellie, Ellie has packed a lot in. Mm. Yes. Yeah, good on her. Yeah. I'm assuming her first flight at nine wasn't actually in the U2, though, hopefully. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, it, hopefully for her it was, but I would be like, I'd be a little bit yeah. jealous of that. If the US Air Force hasn't given her a seat in the U2, hopefully they're working on it. Yeah, yeah. hopefully, hopefully. Right. Very good. It must be time for... Fantasy Hangar. Oh. <laughs> I, sh I thought that was the new streamlined intro to uh, <laughs> hang on. apparently not though <laughs> I, I think it's the heat is, is making this making this a little bit harder than it normally is, <laughs> is it okay fun? fancy hanger who's gonna yeah. go first um should we throw Dave in at the deep end? Yes. I'll maybe oh. oh Dave's gone. It was the pressure. The pressure's got him. I'll explain what fancy hanger is though first, rather than good idea. Um, so it's Oshkosh next week, and that had us wondering what uh, what we could find in the classifieds that would be weird or wonderful to take there. You know, the, the Oshkosh is all about things that are totally unique to pitching up, that kind of stuff, or just things that are totally beautiful. So um, we all went looking in the classifieds and we found these things. So who should we chuck in first? Should we now you've explained it? Should we chuck in Dave while he's here? Yeah. Go Dave, on, what have you gone for? I have gone for a 1945 consolidated Volte PBY 6A. Oh, that's what a gorgeous, good. gorgeous beast that is. And okay. um, uh, and <laughs> operating on water, you take it to Oshkosh. And would you land at Whitman Field? No, you would not. You would land it on the lake and you would stand uh, by the aircraft in the um, – have I frozen on you? No. At the seaplane base. That's right. I mean, nobody else could get in, uh, but um, what, a, what a beautiful thing that would be. That is that's good, and that's that's um, that's a bit of a party bus, isn't it? You've got space, you can camp mm -hmm. in it, and you put you put great big chairs in the blisters so that when yeah. you're bored of flying it, which you never would be, and somebody else is driving you around the sky, you can sit in the back and just watch the world gloriously. Very good. Yeah, I like that choice. You and so, I think that you've got you've got the hatch. You can climb up through the pylon, walk around on the wing watch where obviously watch for the oil that radial engines spray all over the wing so don't fall off into the water have I, have I, i've probably bored you all already with my story of flying the catalina <laughs> but i was flying I, I got the opportunity to have a little bit of stick time in the catalina at duxford and i was flying along and i'm a, i'm a bit of a freak about trimming i think an airplane that's trimmed is so much easier to fly than one that isn't trimmed so I'm like, you know, trimming the Catalina. I think, okay, I've got this. And then it goes out of trim all the time. It wasn't until I realised there were people walking round in walking the back, around. putting yeah. the whole thing out of trim. I go, sit down, for God's sake. <laughs> anyway, there you go. Yeah, so, uh, looks, like, looks like Dave is frozen, unfortunately. Um, Katkin says, is that in the classified, Dave? Yes, I think it's for sale with um, Platinum Fighters at the moment. Mm, so thank good, you. good choice. Who's next? Johnny. <laughs> right, well, I've, I've been on the same website as um, as Dave. Uh, so this is for sale, $1.3 million. Uh, it's a 1960 A4. <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> it's a what, Skyhawk right? you picked. What's that? <laughs> you, you, you said you picked a Skyhawk. 
<laughs> Bugger. <laughs> yeah. I think that really... not the one. Although I'd rather no, take really... that paint. I'd rather take that paint scheme than this one. Um, ah. So this, this is a Ooh. 1960 A4C. Um, it's got 1700 hours on it. It'll do 670 miles an hour at sea level. It's had got 250 hours on the engine since uh, overhaul. Um, it's got yeah, D Dynon D10A EFIS inside. It looks fantastic. That Delta wing on the sky. This isn't the best picture for the Delta wing, but it's a gorgeous, gorgeous platform on the uh, Skyhawk. Uh, great looking airplane. And it, I think it would look it would look good rocking up at Oshkosh in that. But I think if I bought it back to this country, I would have to take the. Uh, Armada de la Republica Argentina paint scheme off. The, the Dynon D10, that's the that's the relatively small instrument, isn't it? I, yeah. I think I I mean no nothing nothing wrong with Dynon, but I'm not sure I'd want something else in in something that does yeah. I, how, how fast does it go again? Six hundred and seventy miles an hour at sea level. Yeah, yeah. you see that's quite a lot. Feel like yeah. we need some screenshot evidence of these ads, says Leia. There's, there's some doubt. There's some doubt that we pick actual real ads, but this yeah. is true. This is stuff you can find for sale. Platinumfighters.com. Platinumfighters.com. Yeah. yeah. Right, Do, what, so, what was the what was the nickname of your your Skyhawk, Johnny? Uh oh, it was the the. Um, <laughs> oh God, remind me, Ed. Well, it was it was many, called many things. The scooter. That's it. Yeah, well, it was one of them, but it was also also called, called Heineman's Hot Rod because um, yeah. designer designer Ed Heineman because uh, it was obviously such a little rocket ship. <laughs> very very cool. Who's not, who's got next choice? Me. And then, given that we've lost both Daves tonight, I thought I'd better represent the world of Davedom and go for a loss. Oh no! <laughs> I know. So I've gone for the. Oh. <laughs> Phantom Luscom. There are only two flying in the world. You can find this online, Leah, for $180,000 is the asking price. You may be able to negotiate. It's got this particular one has 12, just over 1,200 total times it's new. A uh, little Warner Scarab 145 horsepower engine with a couple of hundred hours on it. And the bit, my favorite bit in the ad is it says avionics, none. <laughs> it's just the most gorgeous original 1935 cockpit. Absolute beautiful, beautiful airplane, beautiful restoration. Hundred eighty thousand dollars, a little bit out of my budget, but I reckon that's a bit of a stonker. I reckon that would have a lot of people licking it. At that, would, that would be that would have have you a big crowd in the vintage area. I feel. Yeah. Um, I, interestingly, Ian, your your Luscombe, uh, Don Luscombe, famously said it was easier to learn how to master a violin than than uh, the footwork required to keep the Phantom straight on the ground. Okay, so. <laughs> Probably, if I find one of the owners, they're unlikely to chuck me the keys and go, yeah, just take it for a ride around the pattern. It does, yeah, yeah. And you'd certainly hope that the wind was down the wrong way when you turned up in front of the big audience. Yeah. Mm. No. Okay, well, I'd probably just chuck it in, really. Yeah. Ah, oh, okay. Well, to, talking of trucked in, I happen to know that my particular airplane was trucked in because it was so slow. Um, so so I went for, uh, and this, this aeroplane has been to Oshkosh before and has generated a big crowd, and it's actually for sale at the moment. I found this amazing machine. So this is the Boeing YL-15 Scout. Uh, we once featured it in the mag, uh, which was the first time around that, that it went to Oshkosh. It was Boeing's requ response to a design request for an observer aeroplane, and they went completely mad in response to this question. Um, it had, it's got rear doors at the back that slide almost like patio doors around the aeroplane and you can sit there and stare out the rear i mean as you know this is completely completely bonkers you could be it could be container shipped rapidly reassembled it flies slow 18 mile an hour stall um hmm. 30 mile, 37 mile an hour best angle climb 100 mile an hour cruise 200 mile an hour vne partly so that you could tow it with a much faster aeroplane <laughs> i mean clearly the designers at boeing did drugs didn't they back then yeah. I know, yeah, and as clever as it might be, Cessna's bird dog turned out to be the answer to the question. So, mm. um, anyway, this one is is only twelve were made. This is the last flying example. There's very few that remain, uh, and this one's been in the same family ownership for something like sixty five years, and it's a beautiful restoration. The son of the guy who originally bought it uh, rebuilt it, and he's got all the spare parts uh, pretty much made for the airplane. So, if you're in the market for that, you can find that on Barnstormers and. Um, 
Ring Keith, the owner. It's an amazing machine, and it's it did generate a massive crowd. But uh, I understand that beauty is not always in the eye of the beholder. No, absolutely, absolutely yeah. right. Well, it appears that it's twelve. It's twenty nine minutes past eight, so we need to move on and scootle along a little bit. But um, so, is there anything in the comments? Anyone come up with anything? Well, amazingly, uh, Katkin says it wins. Claire B says Ed has won. Um, I, Chris, I'm not sure how much the Boeing is, but uh, it's not cheap, sadly, because it is incredibly rare. Vince Chadwick, Ed said, I'll take the bird dog. I think that would that would probably be the practical thing. So, mm. um, yeah. Are you, I, are I you suppressing all the votes for the Luscombe? Uh, amazing. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. Ian wins. Dan Smith says Ian wins. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Katkin yeah. says the owner has a caravan to match my Boeing. Yeah, Julian Treadwell, nice. Ian wins. Oh, Dave W wins. Oh, Ian wins. This might be an Ian win situation. I think, yeah. Let's move on, shall we? <laughs> Excellent. I would reconnect Dave, Dave White, but his, his devices are not connected, it says here. So No, and he has popped up in the comments and said, sorry, I've been Zooming for 18 months, no issues, yet tonight, denied broadband. Yeah. There you go. Well, it's so bloody hot, isn't it? Anyway, let's move on. We're running out of time. And, uh, Johnny, do you want to have a quick canter through? In fact, Ed, do you want to have a quick... Bit of uh, the yeah, so uh, we've got. Um, are we going to run the LAA video? Have we got time yep. for that? Yeah, excellent, cool. So, uh, there's some LAA rally news. I spoke to Steve Slater earlier. Hi, Steve. Uh, thanks for taking the time to talk. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to Flyer. Um, so the rally is definitely going ahead. It is. We've been putting an awful lot of. <laughs> Is it finger trouble? I don't know. No, I've not don't, touched it. Don't touch anything, anybody. Hi, no. Steve. Uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to Flyer. Um, so the rally is definitely going ahead. It is. We've been putting an awful lot of work and effort in over the last few months, and we're now sufficiently confident that we can start signing the big checks to rent marquees and various other things that uh, we were holding back on just a little bit not just because of COVID, but because of the COVID recovery uh, challenges as well that Cywell have been facing. Excellent. And this is, uh, the, for those that haven't got it in their calendar yet, it's 3rd to the 5th of September, isn't it? So It is, and I think we're going to find ourselves being the uh, biggest gathering of aircraft in the UK uh, in 2021, sort of little mini Oshkosh in a way. But uh, it's all about making, you know, making our friends, getting get back together, socially distanced, of course, and uh, with appropriate COVID compliance. One of the things we're doing this year is, is it's not just about maintaining the law. It, and we don't know what the law will be, let's be honest, come September. But we've also designed the marquee layout this year so that it's going to have a lot more spacing, a lot more ventilation. So people can genuinely feel safe coming to an event like this, because it's probably going to be the first big event a lot of people have come to. Excellent. Um, so what can, the, uh, apart from the changes in the marquee layout, what else can visitors expect? Well, we're doing very well at the moment on exhibitors, and uh, I'm delighted. And thank you to all the exhibitors that uh, may be watching this who have uh, who've signed up with us to, uh, to show their products. Uh, we'll have at least one, I think, new aircraft that hasn't been seen before. And we'll have quite a lot of older aircraft as well because it's our 75th anniversary. What we'll be doing is having around the site some of the aircraft that tell the story of the 75 years of the Ultralight Aircraft Association, the Popular Flying Association and the LAA. And there are also a lot of people who have been beavering away during lockdown, restoring aircraft, building aircraft and getting aircraft into the air. And we're going to see some of those making their first visits to the LAO rally. I think our rally judges who judge the aircraft for the various trophies and awards, they're going to have a really tough job this year. I suspect there'll be a bumper crop of aeroplanes to pick from. So uh, that'll be an amazing... Well, me, including me, I've got to go and hang the wings on my paper cub this week. Ah, uh, OK. <laughs> Are you are you making a space on the shelf for a trophy, perhaps? <laughs> no, it's an aeroplane to fly. <laughs> um, so the AIC for the event has been published. Um, I hear there's some changes afoot, though, with that. There will be changes inevitably to the AIC. Uh, the AIC was already in process as we've been working through the various issues with the CAA. And the biggest challenge has been that Cywell Aerodrome at the moment don't have enough uh, FISOs, Flight Information Safety Officers, to operate the um, Cywell Information Radio Service. So what we have done is we've worked with them and it still remains Cywell's job to, to handle the airside, 
but we've worked with them to put together a cadre of air to ground radio operators uh, led by our um, uh, chief coach, uh, Chris Thompson, who's also a, a radio examiner. And he's put together a team of people that are suitably experienced in large fly-ins and have flown into the rally who will operate the air to ground radio service. And there's gonna be about six or seven um, air to ground operators who will take turns in the tower to operate that. And that now we've been going through the exercise of satisfying the CAA that uh, they're comfortable for anything up to a thousand aircraft over the weekend to be handled by those air to ground radio operators. Excellent. And will there be some changes to the booking system? For the booking system, yeah, the booking system is going to be slightly different for two reasons. One is that because we're moving to air to ground radio operators, uh, we'll probably be restricted to one aircraft per minute landing. Now, that still sounds a good number, but it does mean that we're going to be reduced by about 30 percent from where we were in 20, the heady days of 2018 and 2019. And I mean, some people remember back to even earlier when in the Cranfield days, it was an utter free for all. And of course, these days with the Civil Aviation Authority's greater uh, diligence of such things, uh, there's no way they will allow that to happen. So we'll have a reduced number of slots. We are also looking at and we're still working on the mechanisms for this, but actually people actually there was a tendency of people to book two or three slots and only turn up for one and it blocked the other two out for other visiting pilots. We're looking at a moment, a mechanism whereby you will pay your landing fee when you book your slot. But if you elect not to come by air, say you're weathered in or something like that, you can still use that as your ticket to get yourself and a guest in through the gate on the, you know, let's say you, you elect to come in on the Friday, you could still use that ticket on a Saturday or a Sunday as well. So you won't lose too much by that. Obviously, if you decide you're, you're not flying in and then you're not coming anyway, then you would lose your uh, your 12 pounds. But I think in the overall scheme of things, that's a pretty sensible way to ensure that uh, people are treating the slot system responsibly. Yes, yeah, no, no I can see why, why you, you make those changes. Um, and uh, I think I'm right in saying that the, your team of, uh, team of uh, the, radio operators there you'll be trialing this out at um at popham uh we're actually going to try it out at sywell we're going to actually everybody's going to travel up for a day to to sywell and they will operate an air to ground radio system whether we'll have that a volume of aircraft in the system it doesn't really matter it's making sure that <laughs> bluntly they know where the on off switch is and things like that um and where the kettle is um so it will be a case of just getting them acclimatized to working in sywell's tower um, we're putting some COVID precautionary measures in there as well, screening, for example, between the two workstations in the tower, uh, again, being COVID compliant. And we're working with the local authorities and ensuring the rest of the site is as well. And it's been great to see events like we did our Flying for Fun air show at a warden last weekend and supported Shuttleworth Collection with theirs. And it's fantastic to see how people have been able to adapt to COVID uh, activities. Theirs is a drive-in air show. We had uh, slots for people who flew in and we had a, a, a lovely seating area in the front row for people to sit in their deck chairs who'd flown in, uh, as well as um, over um, 250 LAA members who turned up my car. So it was a, a, a great event. And uh, it just proves we're, we're all coming out after COVID. And the one thing I would say about the rally is it's going to be a social occasion. It's, it always is. And it's a chance for us to, uh, to get back together with our old friends and make new ones. That's fantastic, Steve. Um, I'm right in saying that there's, uh, if people want to find out more or ask more questions, you've got your uh, LAA pub chat coming up tomorrow night. We have indeed, yes. Uh, for LAA members, and it is member only, unfortunately, by password, um, you should, if you're an LAA member, you should have already got an email with the details on it. We're moving it forward a week. We normally do it on the last Friday of the month, but uh, ourselves and our LAA exhibition trailer will be on our way up north uh, to Ruffeth East for uh, the uh, weekend after next for the uh, We All Fly Day, uh, which the LAA Vale of York Strut have organised with gliding clubs, gyroplanes, uh, hang gliders, uh, micro lights. We're all getting together on one airfield to have a, a great weekend of fun. Well, that's fantastic. There's plenty to be excited about, and we're certainly looking forward to uh, that uh, the 3rd to the 5th of September and uh, seeing you at the rally. Look forward to it. That'd be a great one. Great. Thanks, Steve. Thanks again. Thanks, Ed. Cheers. Well, there we go. Well, looking forward to it. Yeah, me yeah. too. We got we got the video running as well. Let's hope the let's hope the LA rally runs smoother than the technical video thing here. Um, right, we are. We're 10 minutes over, so let's have a quick canter through the events. Johnny? Yep, so uh, first off, the YouTube of flying on the 15th of August is cancelled. If you did PPR, you should have received an email now from John Hunt. 
flying reporter telling you all about that. Uh, the Vintage Aircraft Club flying weekend at Bodmin on the 24th and 25th is a go, as far as I can tell. Aerobatics competition at Leicester on the 24th is go. The Furs Farm fly-in and barbecue on the 24th is also a go, but take your own sausages. And the yeah. air race at Sandown on the 10th, 24th and 25th is a go. And also the private flyer event at Leeds East on the 6th. On the 6th. On the 6th of August. Come and see us there. Yeah. And uh, on the club, we've obviously got the club fly-in on the 31st. I spoke to Bruce earlier today. He's all happy. It's all going ahead. There's over 55 of you PPI'd, which is great. Uh, Nigel Webb. IFR webinar will be on the 4th of August and we've got the UPRT day on the 8th of August run by Ultimate High. So if you haven't booked for that, check your emails and ring greeners. Brilliant. Absolutely. Well, I do believe we've cantered to the end. We're only uh, talking, uh, 10 minutes over. Thank you very much again, Sky Demon, for supporting and being sponsor. We look forward to a long and, and beneficial relationship and another tip next week. Um, thank, thank you very you. much, Johnny. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Dave, the stunt Dave, the body double yeah. Dave, who, who's... Thank you, Dave Cordero, who wasn't here. And uh, we'll, Dave will be back next week. And we'll see you next week, by which time it may be a little bit cooler because it's mm. tad warm here. Thanks very much, everyone. And we'll see you soon. Bye, Bye See you soon. Bye. Bye. Hang on a second. Just going to scroll up here. There you go. Bye.